Race conditions cause the hardest types of bugs to debug, so we need to learn how to know when they could happen and how to prevent them. In this video, I'll show you exactly how they happen, because understanding that is the first step toward being able to prevent them. A race condition is when the behavior of the system depends on the timing of how threads run. Unless we do something to control them, threads run asynchronously, and they share system resources like the processor. That means that when one thread is running, another thread may not be able to run. One might run for a bit, and then the operating system makes it pause so that another gets a chance to run. Even if we have multiple cores so that all the threads can run, they still don't run in sync. This means that our code is no longer deterministic. Every time we run it, there's a random effect caused by how the threads share the system. That's what makes race conditions really hard to debug. The problems they cause don't happen the same every single time. To have a race condition, we have to have some piece of shared data, and at least one of the threads has to write that data. The timing of threads accessing that shared data is what causes the race condition. Let's look at a system that has a race condition. I'm using Java for my example, but the concepts generalize. This incrementer class is a thread, which is just incrementing a variable x a given number of times. The important thing to note is that x is marked static. That means that there is only one x for this class. All instances of this class share the same variable x. When one thread changes its values, all of the threads will see that new value. This class is my runnable class. Its only job is to create a bunch of incrementers, start them, wait for them to be finished, and then print out the value of x. Every thread will increment x number of tries times, and we will start number of threads of them. If everything goes well, x should be 15,000. First, Let's watch it run a couple of times. Fascinating. A lot of times we got 15,000, but did you see that 9,850 go by? Why did it not increment X the right number of times? We need to investigate. Let's look at the code in the incrementer. We said that a race condition requires writing to a shared variable. So I want to show you exactly what happens with this statement. Look at the Java bytecode. I really wish this view would stay docked. This is the code that is output by the Java compiler. It has some stuff to help us get oriented. Every method is named, and each line gets a label and they even connect that with the line number of the source code. So, source code line 14 has been translated to this code. To understand that code, we need to know one more thing. In addition to having a call stack, each thread has an operand stack. Bytecode does math by pushing operands onto the stack, and then operations like add take their operands from the top of the stack. Let's watch exactly how that operand stack works when one thread runs through this code. Yes, this is the bytecode that increments x. I'll mark the instruction that the thread is running with a blue arrow, and this blue box is its operand stack. GetStatic gets the value of the static variable and pushes it onto the thread's operand stack. iConst1 pushes a 1 on the operand stack iAd is going to pop the top two operands off the stack and add them together. It will then push the result, 1, back onto the stack. Finally, putStatic pops the operand stack and puts the result into the static variable. OK, that does what we expected. x got bigger by 1. Now, suppose we have two threads, blue and red. If they take turns and always get to complete this section of code during one turn, everything will be OK. Each pass through the code will increment x, just like we expect. However, watch what happens if one gets interrupted in the middle of this code. I'm going to start x at 0 again. Let's let the blue thread start. 
it gets the value of x and puts the 1 on the stack. Then, let's say it gets interrupted. I've denoted that by making its arrow be dashed, which means it's paused, but it'll execute iAd when it gets to run again. While the blue thread is paused, let's let the red thread run. It gets the value of x, pushes the 1, executes the iAd, puts the value into x. That looks good. Let's say now that the blue stack gets to run. It executes its iAd, and then writes the value to x. Wait! We just let two threads complete the code, but x is only one. That is our race condition problem. We have lost an increment. When the blue thread got to run the second time, it completed its increment, but it had an old value of x, and there is no way for it to know that. So when it wrote its value to x, we essentially lost the increment that the red thread has done. That's why our example code didn't always get to 15,000. Well, that was a really specific example of a race condition, but what it demonstrates is not limited to that example, or even to Java. That problem can happen in any language that has multiple threads that aren't synchronized. The problem happens when one thread reads the shared value and then gets interrupted. If another thread updates that shared data while the first is paused, when the first gets to run again, it has an old value of the data in its local space. If it uses that value, we have a race condition error. A thread can use that out-of-date value two ways. The one we just watched is called read, modify, write, which means that the thread that got interrupted has an old value, and what it writes will not be current. That's how our blue thread caused us to lose the increment that the red thread wrote. The other way a thread can be affected by an old value is called check then act. In this case, a thread is reading a shared value and then making a decision based on that value. If it gets interrupted between the read and the decision, then it could make the decision based on an old value of shared data, causing a race condition error to happen again. Race conditions are really subtle. I'll make another video about detecting them by looking at the code and then we'll talk about preventing them.